Mike Florio from ProFootballTalk.com and NBC Sports Network. He joins us on the program. How are you, Mike? Oh, I'm doing great. I, Dan, you can sing. You still sing that Hey Now, Hey Now, Don't Dream It's Over song at NBC. <laughs> yeah, I know. I tend to sing that every weekend. That's the problem. <laughs> as you hear me down the halls as it echoes through the Saturday Night Live studios. Uh, uh, did you get into a little uh, tete-a-tete with the NFL about this regional combine and the female place kicker? Well, just just a little bit, and I, I was surprised by it. I mean, my whole point is that this clearly was a publicity stunt because Lauren Silverman has zero credentials, no proven ability, never played football before. And I was under the impression that they did some vetting of these folks before they let them come to the regional scouting combine. But really the end result of my discussion on Twitter with NFL spokesman Greg Aiello is that anybody with $275 and a pair of cleats can show up and try out for the NFL, which I think is the real story. I think open the floodgates. It's American Idol time at these regional combines. <laughs> but is it good? Are we are we actually morphing into something, a real? I keep saying the combine is inching closer and closer to reality TV, that they'd like to do more where we're, we're looking at who's doing this, why they're doing it, and what their backstory is. Well, and, and that's what – some at the league office would like to capitalize on or exploit, as the case may be, because at the end of the day, you get more and more people showing up with $275, the NFL is going to make a ton of money off of this. The question becomes, how much of this nonsense do you want to subject the scouts to? I don't think any NFL scout wants to go to this thing and see a bunch of people who have absolutely no football skill, but who think they do. And and even though some people would be doing it as a joke, there would be plenty of people who actually believe they have a chance, that they can run a 4-3, that they can do all the things that the NFL expects someone to be able to do. And that's where this thing potentially can go off the rails for the NFL. And they have to ask themselves, how far do they want to go with allowing this very real, supposedly, scouting process to become a reality show? And, and what we saw Sunday with Lauren Silverman, who – couldn't kick the ball more than 20 yards, is that it was a reality show, and, and I just don't think it fits with what the NFL really should be trying to do. They may want to do it, but I just don't think it fits with what the NFL should be doing. What should the Patriots be doing with Wes Welker? Well, they need to work something out by next Tuesday. Now, the problem is you can't use the franchise tag on him because it would have been $11.4 million to keep him around. Now, the ace in the hole for the Patriots is Danny Amendola. He's the slot receiver from the Rams, several years younger than Wes Welker. He's had plenty of injuries, but he's one of the toughest players in the NFL. It could be that the Patriots already have plans, and, you know, tampering's not supposed to be happening, but every team is doing it. They may already have an understanding that first day of free agency, they're going to ink in Danny Amendola to replace Wes Welker, which would make a lot of sense if that's what they do. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Well, and the Rams, you know, the Rams couldn't justify using the franchise tag on Amendola because for a slot receiver to pay him $10 million, you, you just can't justify that kind of money. But it's an important position to take care of. And, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if Amendola's a Patriot next Tuesday. I've been saying for a while that Buffalo has been looking for a quarterback, whether it was uh, quietly, but, you know, maybe they get one in the draft. Ryan Fitzpatrick's future in Buffalo as their starting quarterback is what? Well, I think it's eight days. I think he's going to get cut next Tuesday or Wednesday because he's got $3 million coming due if he's on the roster at the end of the day next Wednesday. There hasn't been any talk about it. Everybody's quiet, but they, they hurried up to get Tavares Jackson under contract a couple of weeks ago because I think they feared cutting Ryan Fitzpatrick, not having Jackson under contract. Who's your quarterback then, Brad Smith? So I think they are going to look to the draft or wherever else they can find somebody. I wouldn't be surprised if they sign a cheaper veteran in free agency and then see what they can do in the draft. You know, there's one guy out there. Matt Moore was the Dolphins' team MVP in 2011. He started 12 games. He had a passer rating of almost 90. I mean, the guy can play. Yeah, I like I him. See, I can see the Bills making a run for a guy like that and saying, just you know, do what you did two years ago. I want to bring you back, if I can, take a break and ask you about the Jets with Darrell Revis, what's going to happen there, uh, the real deal that Joe Flacco signed, who's the next quarterback to sign that big deal, and why is the NFL not going to have a team in Los Angeles anytime soon? We'll continue with Mike Florio. We'll do so next on the Dan Patrick Show. Now, let me go back to the Combine for a moment because you started this story and you said that teams wanted to know about Manti Teo's sexuality 
trying to get around that by asking questions. Then we find out that they're asking questions to other players at the Combine. Is the NFL going to do anything about it? Can they do anything? Is there a directive here? Well, the NFL can investigate, and the NFL can take action against any teams that were determined to have asked inappropriate questions. The NFL doesn't have to tell anybody what it's doing, and there haven't really been any developments in the past week. I think the real issue here, Dan, is that even though the questions were inappropriate, you're talking about a very small handful of applicants for jobs who are never going to be in position to file a lawsuit if they don't get drafted, if they get cut, whatever the case may be. You've got guys who are the product of the football machine from high school through college. They're not troubled by these questions. They don't see the problem. They just want to play football. And the fact that the NFL is never going to face a real threat of litigation over this attitude toward players who are or who are perceived to be gay there's never going to be an external reason to change. And we've seen so many changes in the workplace over the last 50 years because of litigation. The NFL, if it's going to change, is going to change without that threat of litigation, which means on this point, the NFL may never change. Yeah, but Mike, all you have to do is you can talk to the Colorado tight end. The commissioner says, I want to talk to you. Uh, did they? Who, what, give me the team who asked you, so you like girls, and then you can get to the bottom of this. Then all of a sudden teams know that you're going to be called out or called onto the carpet by the commissioner here. He wants to well, find out. He can find out. Well, that's right. But then the question is, what does he, what does he do? D does he issue a, a press release like the one we saw a year ago with the bounty scandal, slapping the team down, taking away draft picks, finding the team? <laughs> I mean, that, that's the real question. Yeah. Do they brush it all under the rug or do they come out strong and say, look, this is unacceptable, this needs to end. I mean, you could make the argument that they need to have the same reaction to, to these kinds of questions that they had to the bounty scandal, and, and I, I don't think they will. But, but the, the absence of the threat of litigation, remember, what's at the root of the bounty scandal? The issue of player health and safety. And why is the NFL so concerned about it? Because they got 4,000 former players who are suing them. Until the NFL is worried about getting sued or otherwise losing money because of this, I don't think we're going to see the same level of, of reaction. Any time frame for the Jets to make a decision on Darrell Rivas? Well, n not really. I mean, you'd like to do it before this year's draft if you're going to trade him for draft picks. But, the, you know, the problem continues to be you're going to have to make the Jets happy with a trade offer, and you're going to have to make Rivas happy with yeah. a contract offer, and he's coming off a torn ACL. And who's going to give the Jets anything of value if they possibly are only getting Revis for one year. Under his contract, he's free and clear after next year, and you can't use the franchise tag on him. So he's gone. So unless you can get a deal with him, you're wasting draft picks. And unless you know if he can run, you're wasting money too. So I, 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 there's just too many things, I think, that have to come together to make this work. Meanwhile, it's this year's great New York Jets distraction, and it will continue to be. Joe Flacco's contract, how does that affect the next quarterbacks in order? I guess Aaron Rodgers uh, is next, and then Matt Ryan? Well, Matt Ryan's next. He's okay. teed up. He came in the same year for whatever reason. And I credit Aaron Rodgers on this point. He's got two more years under contract at less than $10 million a year. There are more and more guys breaking the $20 million barrier, and one of the best quarterbacks in football is making half of what these other guys are making. The Packers have to take care of him at some point. And they haven't shown any inclination to do it. And Rodgers has shown no inclination to demand it, which really does surprise me. But Ryan is next up, and, and he'll get a little bit more than Flacco. I mean, Flacco got a little bit more than Breeze. Ryan will get a little bit more than Flacco. At some point, Tony Romo is going to get a little bit more than Ryan. And then Matthew Stafford's going to get his deal. Then comes Aaron Rodgers. And three years from now, we'll be back with Flacco, and he'll be trying to get whatever the high water mark is at that point. Yeah, I find it interesting that Brady public perception, what he did, why didn't Flacco do that? Why didn't Flacco say, we won a Super Bowl, I plan on winning more, I'm going to be paid you know, more in my, than I am in my wildest dreams here, instead of maxing out here because your agent says, well, you got to be the highest paid quarterback. Well, first of all, Flacco's a lot younger than Brady. Brady was looking for essentially a retirement contract, and, and Flacco has a lower cap number this year. He's only $6.8 million. Brady is $13.8 million. The challenge for Flacco is year four, that cap number goes to $29 million. The Ravens are going to want to do a new contract then. So this is a three-year deal, and then they're going to do a new contract. But see, Flacco will have the leverage then because he's got that $29 million cap number. What are the Ravens going to do, cut him? So if he doesn't like the offer, he just says, I'll just take my $29 million cap number and we'll just go play football. Where Brady really put himself in a box, in, in three years, 2015, 
two years. When his salary goes down to $7 million, I mean, if he's the defending Super Bowl MVP and he's got a $7 million salary and Robert Kraft told Peter King they're not going to redo this deal, Brady's really put himself in a box here. I'm surprised. I mean, why not just take a higher salary now for 2015? You can always cut it down later. It doesn't affect the cap number this year. This was a cap deal. This was reducing cap space in 2013 and 2014. He could have a $30 million salary in 2015. It wouldn't affect this year's cap. Cut it down later. He really put himself in a corner. I mean, I'm surprised at what Brady's done to his future earning potential by, by signing that contract. And, you know, Flacco may do the same thing when he's 35 years old. What happened to the L.A. franchise? I, you know, I saw the report from Jason Cole and the the, the, the – the farmer's field, the AEG, downtown thing, it's essentially dead. I, look, whatever the NFL does in L.A., they are going to squeeze every last dollar out of whoever it is that wants to build that stadium. And, and I just think this may be part of the rhetoric aimed at trying to get the people who want to build that stadium. But how important is a team in Los Angeles? Well, I, look, how long has it been? Since there's been a well, that, in LA. But, but it, does L.A., is it more important to the NFL or Los Angeles? I think it's, well, the NFL has had unprecedented financial success without a team in L.A. for a generation. Yes. Yeah. So the NFL looks at it and says, and the NFL's attitude, Dan, has always been, we're not going back unless the deal is absolutely right, which means until <laughs> we believe we're going to make a major financial killing, until we find someone who is going to do a bad deal so we can walk away with a great deal, and that time hasn't come yet. And, and until someone in L.A. is desperate enough to bring the NFL back and lose money in the process, I don't see it happening. Good stuff, Mike. Thanks for staying with us for an extra segment. All right, buddy. All right, Mike Florio, NBC Sports Network.